humbled to be speaking after Rosemarie because she has um, blazed the trail on, on a national level. And um, while I have done some work on a national level, most of my work has been concentrated in the southeast and, and mostly in South Carolina. I've, I've had quite a journey, and you're going to hear some about that journey and some of the, the practices and tips that I'm going to give you that I've learned over the years myself. But before I do that, I just want to ask, we learned a little bit about the demographics in the room, so I'm going to ask you to put down your fork for one quick second and just tell me how many of you are administrators? Okay. How many of you are nurses? Okay. How many of you are social workers? Okay. Any direct care staff? Nurses, CNAs? Yeah, a few. All right. Welcome. We're so glad. We're so glad you're here. Let me tell you a little bit about myself. Why should you be listening to me for the next two hours? I grew up in a little town called Greenwood, South Carolina, just across the border. My grandmother, she died from heart failure issues. My grandfather was so lonely after she died that I believe he developed Alzheimer's or dementia as a result of being so alone after she was gone. But let me back up. My grandmother, that I look a lot alike, she used to take me to what was called the Old Methodist Home back then. It was a three-story brick sniff. Some of you may be familiar with that kind of. It was set up in a cross shape. It was three stories brick, still there, still operating today. But at that time, you did not walk by an elder in the hallway without stopping and speaking to them. That was just not done <laughs> with my grandmother. And so even as a child at five years of age, I had to stop and speak to everybody as I went down the hallway. My mom said, well, Karen, I don't know what you're going to be when you grow up, but there are two things I do know. One, you really work well with old people, and two, you can argue with a brick wall. <laughs> I don't know how, I, I think that's how I wound up. I was cursed to wind up in long-term care, and, and especially in this of culture change. When I was in college at, at the University of South Carolina, I remember one day I was walking across the street, and I remember praying this really simple prayer as I was walking across the street. I don't know what got into me at that moment as I was walking across that street, but I remember saying, Dear God, I'm not sure what I want to do with my life. I don't have any idea. Y'all ever been there and done that? Yeah. Yep. Um, but whatever it is, could you please help me make a difference? I didn't know where that was going to lead me. I got a nursing degree, and lo and behold, I wound up back at Wesley Commons, which was the Methodist home where I had walked down those hallways with my grandmother. And um, the president of Wesley Commons and I became good friends while I was in nursing school, and he said, Karen, I want you to come and work for me. And I want you to find everything new and innovative about long-term care and bring it back and make it possible here on our campus. Wesley Commons is a CCRC, um, so we had a SNF, assisted living and independent care and all those things. And so I've really taken that on right there as my life's work, to find anything new and innovative that makes sense and bring it back and make it possible for my elders, the people that are, are in my care. So at that time, it was 97, 98. I didn't know about this culture change thing, but there was an article on my desk that my boss had given me that was about these greyhounds in an in a Asheville nursing home. And I said, that's kind of unique and out of the box. Let me find out about that. And so at that time, Bill Thomas and Jude Thomas were just beginning to travel around the country and talk about culture change. And so I had the opportunity to go to a place called Lake Junaluska, North Carolina. Um, if you've never been there, it's a wonderful place to go and um, spend a couple of days with Bill and Jude and learn about this thing called culture change, this thing called the Eden Alternative, and, and really begin to ponder that and, and try to figure that all out. Now, I know Rosemary talked a, a little bit about helplessness, loneliness, and boredom, and I'm just going to dig into it a little bit more because, for me, this idea of loneliness, helplessness, and boredom just, like, sunk in and hit me in my chest really, really hard. And so I just want to spend a few moments talking about that. Helplessness, Bill says, is the logic of long-term care consistently violates the deep-seated human need to balance the giving and receiving of care. People are trapped in a situation in which they receive far more care than they give, and this imbalance inevitably leads to helplessness. Can you imagine, God forbid, you're in a, in a wreck, and tomorrow you need to be admitted to a nursing home and you can no longer care for anything else? That would be a really helpless feeling, wouldn't it? Yeah, so what we're talking about is creating an environment so that you as a person can still continue to be vibrant and alive and still continue to meet that basic human need you have of providing care and assistance, not just for yourself, but for others as well. Loneliness, the art of giving care, depends on companionship to give care <coughs> depth and substance. Without companionship, long-term care can offer only the cruel comfort of strangers 
feeding, bathing, dressing, and entertaining strangers. Think about that for a second. This came home to me with my grandfather that I mentioned earlier. When I was working at Wesley Commons, I was, was primarily working on the independent side of things, but when they were short-staffed in the skilled nursing home, the director of nursing would call me up and she, at 5 o'clock in the morning, and she'd say, Karen, one of my nurses called in. Can you come work the floor, as it was called back then? There's that language thing again. So my grandfather ended up having some complication and wound up in the skilled care. And one night about 9 o'clock, one of the nurses on second shift, who was a coworker to me, she called me up and she said, you have got to come up here. That was her tone of voice. Okay, well, why? Because I cannot pass all these meds to all these people and take care of your grandfather at the same time. Okay. So I'm in my car and I'm on the way up there. You know what was wrong? He just didn't remember how to take his shoes off. And somebody just needed to say, okay, let's take your shoe off. She didn't have time for that. Um, now, do I think that she's a bad person? No. I don't think she's a bad person. Again, I think the process is broken and the process needs to be fixed so that she has time to do those things to help him put the toothpaste on his toothbrush and brush his teeth. But that is, to me, a stark example of being in the care of strangers. Because nursing homes are operated as therapeutic institutions, machine-like efficiency is their ideal. This approach to daily life has a deadening effect on all who must live and work under its sway. Everyone needs to feel the fresh breeze of the unexpected, even if it does not blow every day. Now this boredom thing, this is not like my three girls saying, Mom, I'm bored. And I say to them, I can find you something to do to get rid of your boredom. <laughs> That's not that kind of boredom. I'm talking about that sort of soul deep boredom where you're staring at the same four walls day after day. I'm talking about eating the same food day after day. When I got to uh, Roger Huntington that I'll tell you about in a little while, ham was on the menu every Friday evening for dinner. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm not going to look forward to eating dinner Friday night if every single Friday night I'm having ham. Are y'all? No. That's what I'm talking about, this bone deep soul boredom. Yeah, I'm seeing the faces again. Awesome. Okay. There's a lot of research around people who've lived 100 years these days because, as we've talked about, our country is aging. The graying of America is happening. And so people are wondering, what does it mean to live to 100 or past 100? What is it about people that helps them to live that long? And one of the things that we know is stress. People that are lived over 100, they manage stress really well. But there are mental and physical consequences of stress. And look there. What's the first one? Loneliness. We are just talking about that, okay? So loneliness, helplessness, and boredom, it can happen whether we're talking about a nursing home or an assisted living or someone in their own home. I often think people in the community are some of the most lonely, helpless, and bored people in America right now. I actually think some of the people in the nursing homes can be the lucky ones, <laughs> if you want to know the truth. Social isolation, feelings of worthlessness, there it is. Loneliness, helplessness, and boredom. It's just in different words. Heart attack, asthma, diabetes, headaches, some types of cancer, and the common cold, those are all pieces that happen as a result of stress. But what is the buffer for stress? Social support. Social support is the buffer for stress, and close relationships are the bread of life. Research says it in terms of what helps people live past 100 years of age. A 2000 survey by the National Council on Aging talks about adults age 75 and older. Here's what they said. Family and friends were the most important aspect of a meaningful, vital life, followed by what? Health. Health. You know, we've got this medical model. Everything revolves around the med cart. We get up, we do this, we do that, we do the other. But that's not what our own elders in our own country are telling us. They're telling us that it's not their health that matters the most to them. It's family and friends and those close relationships that matter the most to them. And that's all important to a successful late life. Um, who has a rich spiritual life, being involved in the community, and having new learning experiences. They're telling us we just need to listen. Everyone needs a mountaintop experience. Everyone needs to sit on that stone wall and um, look out over that lake as it's starting to snow and, and sink into themselves and think this through and think, how am I going to be different? How am I going to act differently? Everybody in your staff needs to do that. Make sure you give yourself your elders, your staff, your family members, and your community various opportunities to have this experience. Everybody doesn't experience it the same way. you got to have some patience. If there's one thing this process has taught me is it's patience. 
And I didn't have it beforehand, <laughs> I'll tell you that. Here's the other thing that you got to understand. At some point, you got to say, this is the bus, and this is where we're going, and you've had opportunities to get on it and go with us, or you don't, okay? Um, one of the things that I learned real early on was that we're all adults. And so I can't make you choose to be a part of this. And gosh knows, as much as I hate it, there's still nursing homes out there doing it the old way. Okay? So those people can go get a job there. But if you choose to walk this road, the people in your organization have to choose to walk that road with you. And we tried for a long time, years ago, this was one of the debates early on, was, you know, do you work with people and you work with people and you work with people and you try to get them on board? Yeah, you do. And at some point, as a leader, you got to make a decision. Is this going to work? Or, or do we need to, to part ways, okay? So I want to say that really clearly. That's a hard thing to say, and I know some people might not like hearing me say it, but I'll tell you from somebody who's walked it, that's the truth. We created what we called a statement of understanding at the very beginning of employment that we went over with them their very first day on the job. And so we would work through that statement of understanding. I understand that if my sister cottage needs me, I will go. I understand that I'm expected to behave in this manner. I understand that I'm going to work around animals and I'm going to treat them as respectfully as I would a family member or an elder. And if you don't do that, then I've already done my HR paperwork and you know what's going to happen. We also had a few people right at the very beginning when we first moved who thought that in this new environment of 12 cottages that it was going to be easier for them to get away with doing nothing because they wouldn't, wouldn't have as many people supervising them. I'll tell you, as a director of nursing, and, and I became the administrator there, I knew more what was happening in those 12 cottages than I ever do in Roger Huntington. Because in Roger Huntington, people could hide down those long hallways. In those cottages, you couldn't hide because somebody was going to tell on you. And it was probably going to be an elder that was going to tell on you. Um, and so the other thing that, that uh, this sounds so silly, but in terms of an HR perspective, you wouldn't believe I actually was challenged on it. Um, to me, if you're asleep on third shift and you're caught sleeping, you're gone. It's not, a, it's not a conversation, but that was another thing we had to put in our statement of understanding so that we've told you up front, you're sleeping on third shift, you're not going to work here anymore, and then there was no argument about it. You're sleeping on third shift, you're not working here anymore, period, end of conversation. So a roadmap for change. You have to have a time for learning. Send people out, have in-services, do things there um, in your organization, do things in your community, um, go visit other places. Whatever it is that is a time for learning for you and a time for self-examination. As I've traveled around the country, I've seen wonderful things and I've seen things that I thought, huh, I do it better than that. <laughs> um, and that's okay. Self-examination is a big part of it. Organizational assessment. You gotta, you gotta think about your organization and how it's gonna work. You gotta have a mission and a vision and a values and you gotta hold them to that. Every time I have a staff meeting, which I have once a month, the very first thing I put up there on the screen is our mission, our vision, and our values. And I say, what is it that we're doing to meet that mission and that vision and values? And I put it in front of people day after day after day. And then there's planning and implementation. And just like the nursing process, you go through that over and over again. Because let me tell you, you may go through that and things may go well. And you remember how Rosemary said it's a journey and you never really get there? That's so true because you do all that process and then you go, oh, I missed this, and now I got to do it again, okay? This is another person that I met along the way on my journey. This is Lavreen Norton. I spent about a year working for Lavreen. She runs a company called Action Pack um, out of Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and they travel all over the world and are part of the Pioneer Network and served on the board and all sorts of things like that. Lavreen taught me some real concrete things that I want to share with you. This is the first one. If you don't hear me say anything else today, please hear me say this. There are three parts to changing your organization and your home. One without the other two pieces is nothing but a change. It's just change for change's sake. You have to have the other two. So we spent a lot of time this morning talking about personal care and spiritual renewal, that values piece of it, examining who we are and what we believe. The second part of that is then if you believe these values, if you believe that every person um, should be respected and makes a difference, if you believe that risk-taking is a normal part of life, then your processes have to change. You, it's not enough just to believe it. Back in the early days, we used to have people that would come to end services like this, and then they'd go home, and they'd say, oh, well, that didn't work. Or they'd have me come in, and I'd talk to their staff and their CNAs, and then I'd come back six months later, and they'd say, well, that didn't work. 
Well, sure, it didn't work. If you do any kind of education and you don't follow it up with planning and implementation and process, does it work? No, right. So it has to be people, it has to be values, and that value has to drive your processes, okay? The third part of that is the environment, and we talked a little bit about that as well, but there's an architectural term called environmental press, and I've seen it lived out in real life. You might not believe me, but it's so true, okay? What is environmental press? It means that if you go into a church, you're going to act like you're in a church. You're going to behave like you're in a church. If you go into a school, there are certain norms and behaviors that we have in a school. You're going to behave like you're in a school. Yep. If you go into a hospital, you're going to behave like you're in a hospital, right? Well, there are certain behaviors that sort of go along with our environment in a nursing home as well. And so that environmental press, that environment has to change and become more home. Not home-like, right? But home. Um, because then at home, we interact differently with each other. We behave differently with each other. And so you can make all of the personal value changes you want. You can even make some great process changes. But I guarantee you it's going to slide back if you don't change your environment some. So please remember those three things. Every value has to have a process change, has to have some environmental change to support that. In terms of people... There were three books that were meaningful to me in terms of my leadership. The first one is a book called The Servant by a guy named J.C. Hunter. I mean, he taught me that as a leader, I have to first serve. He taught me that love is a verb. I mean, he taught me that it doesn't matter what my feelings are for somebody. My actions have to speak love. Now, that might sound crazy to you. That might sound woo to you. I don't know. <laughs> but it makes sense to me because let me tell you, your staff that are working, that are caring for your elders, you know who they are? They're single moms, a lot of them. They come from broken homes themselves. They haven't been loved themselves. And yet we as a society, we entrust them into their care. You know why they're there? It's not just for the paycheck. They're there because the elders love them. It's some of the only times in their lives when they get genuine love in return. And so as a leader, I had to first start off by loving my staff. I had to get to know them because they weren't going to let me lead them anywhere until they knew they could trust me. So what did I do? I answered call lights. <laughs> that was always funny. They'd come in there and find me helping somebody in the toilet and be like, <gasps> what is she doing? <laughs> I'm helping somebody in the restroom. That's what I'm doing. Um, my nurses would get behind passing meds, and I'd get in there and help them pass meds. What is she doing? I'm a nurse. I can do this too. You know, I, they had to, I had to earn their trust and vice versa. So uh, love was a huge part of that. Also, though, J.C. Hunter taught me that there has to be a soft and a hard approach. <laughs> you have to create some boundaries or otherwise chaos is going to happen. Let me tell you what happened to me. So one of the first things I noticed um, right away was that um, during lunchtime, the trays would get delivered and then there'd be no staff around. You wouldn't see anybody anywhere. And I was like, what's up with this? And so one of the first things I said was, I don't care when you take your lunch. But by God, nobody in this building is going to take their lunch while the elders are having their lunch. We're all going to help with lunch. We're all going to be out there. We're going to be involved, right? I thought I was doing pretty good. Next day, I go up on the floor. Everybody's engaged in lunch. Everything's good. I'm thinking, oh, yeah, this worked. About an hour later, I go up on the second floor. Guess what happened? Nobody was there. I didn't give them any boundaries. I said, I don't care when you take your lunch. They took me at my word. They all went to lunch after they gave the elders lunch. This did not work. <laughs> so I had to say, okay. Time out. The nurse is in charge on the floor. She's going to get everybody together, and you are all going to decide. Half of you are going to go to lunch before lunch. Half of you are going to go to lunch after lunch. Boundaries. <laughs> okay? So it's good intentions, but you have to create a framework. And then within that framework, I was not going to stand on the floor and tell them, hey, you know, Amy, Anna, and Jane, you're going first lunch. Uh-uh. They had to decide it. You with me? They had to decide it, but I created the boundaries for them to decide it with them. Does that make sense? Okay. 
All right, so Mary Kay, y'all are thinking, oh my God, this girl really is off her rocker. What could she learn from Mary Kay Ash? Well, <laughs> there's a lot you can learn from Mary Kay Ash. She was a really wise woman. Did you know she started the Mary Kay cosmetic business when she was 55? She was an elder that created a multi-billion dollar industry. She's a smart lady. And one of the things that she said was that everybody you see, you need to see them with a, a sign hanging around their neck that says, make me feel important. And you need to read that sign every time you walk up to somebody and make them feel important. Now, that doesn't matter whether that's a staff member, that's a family member, or that's an elder in your community. You need to see them with a sign hanging around their neck that says, make me feel important. Now, I goofed on that, too, I'll tell you. Um, part of what J.C. Hunter taught me and Mary Kay taught me is you need to listen to people. And I'm talking about listen to people. We're all busy. We're running here, there, and yonder. And so I remember, I remember distinctly, I can still see myself standing near the, the, the stairway on our second floor, and one of my CNAs is trying to talk to me, and I'm saying, okay, yes, and I'm backing up from her as I'm walking towards the stairs. Was I listening to her? No. And so being self-aware, remember that self-examination that I talked about was part of the process? It also requires you to be self-aware because I had to go back up to her later and say, Christy, I am so sorry. I, I didn't listen to you earlier. I was in a rush. I was thinking about this other thing that was really important, and I'm sorry. You know, let me listen to you now. Do you think that I scored points to, to you could say with Christy? Yeah, because next time Christy said to me, Karen, I know you're busy right now, but I also know you really want to listen. So when can we set a time that we can really talk and communicate with each other? That flattening of the organization really started to happen right there. The other one is a book by Cousins and Posner that's called The Leadership Challenge, and I live by these five tenets. I believe you have to model the way. If you think people aren't watching you, you're dead wrong. People are constantly watching what you do and how you behave. If you walk by an elder, they're going to think it's okay to walk by an elder. Um, if you don't stop and listen, they're going to think it's okay for them not to stop and listen. Um, you have to be on stage, if you will, all the time. Because people are going to watch you and they're going to say, it's okay, I can behave that way because she did that. Think about it. Have you ever done that? Have you ever walked by a piece of paper on the ground and said, that's not my job because you saw somebody else do it? That's the other thing that I, I made a hard rule about, about my first day on the job as well, is there are two things that really matter to me. And, and, and I've done this everywhere I've gone. There are two things that matter to me that you don't say to me as an administrator or an executive director or whatever. You don't say, that's not my job. <laughs> because I will ask you to invite you not to come back right on the spot. <laughs> um, and um, if you tell me that's not my elder or that's not my resident, you just made a career decision in my community because everybody is my elder and my resident. Everybody. I don't care who you're assigned to. Thank you. <laughs> um, I don't care whose call light is going off. Don't stand there and not respond to it. And so... That's the hard part of being a servant leader. As much as I will listen, I also have rules, if you will, that I expect to be followed, and those are some of them. So I have to model that way as well. I cannot not pick up the piece of paper when I walk by it. I cannot not change the light bulb if I see it out. I have to do all those things as well. I have to hold myself accountable. So you have to inspire a shared vision. You have to constantly put things in front of people. I was telling some folks last night, I, um, I put quotes all over our building. You can look them up. They're all over the place. But I would print off these quotes, and I would put them all over the building. You can tape them up. You can put them in frames, whatever you want to do. But every two weeks or so, I changed them because they were constantly smacking people in the face about their own personal journey. Does that make sense? You'd be reading that as you walked up the stairway, and it'd be like, huh, you know, am I, am, am I making um, quality better? You know, what am I doing to love somebody today? Those kinds of things. So as we worked through people skills of like conflict resolution, I would post, here's how you work through conflict resolution in the stairwell so that you're reading it as you went around. You have to keep it in front of people all the time. At the end of every one of my staff meetings, we do a video of pictures and music that has gone on during that month because I want to continually inspire that shared vision of community and where we're going and what we're trying to do. Challenge the process. you got to challenge every process. You also have to learn to do it in a respectful manner. 
If people don't bring me something in a respectful manner, I'm probably not going to listen to them. So I work with my staff to learn because, they, again, where do, these, where do a lot of folks come from? They haven't learned those skills. So it's my responsibility as a leader to teach them those skills so they know how to come to me and work these things through to challenge the process respectfully. And we'll talk about some of the ways we challenge that process. Enable others to act. you got to empower them. And sometimes this is hard as a leader. I learned this as well. There are times people came to me and they said, you know, we want to do this, Karen. And I'd say, oh, in my head, I'd think, oh, that's not going to work. <laughs> and then I'd say, out of my mouth, I'd say, why don't you give it a try? Because it wasn't going to hurt anybody. And, you know, about three weeks later, they'd come back and they'd say, oh, that didn't work. What do you, what do you think? And I'd say, um, well, what if we tried this? Because the other thing is it has to be a combination. People have to own it. It has to be some of their idea. And so you've got to create an environment where it's safe for people to share those ideas and have them bubble up. And then encourage the heart. People don't do this work for the paycheck. Mm -mm. They do it because it matters to them. Here's what's happened. Out of that environment that I created, those, those sort of basic principles that I just showed you, here's a process change. I believed that it was important for people to know who was taking care of them. But I didn't want just a board in every room like the hospital does. So at, at the entryway to each of those hallways that I showed you, we put up a big whiteboard like this so that every day we wrote up who was the people that was taking care of the elders on that neighborhood or that hallway that day. We also consistently assigned our staff. How did I consistently assign the staff? I invited my mouths. You know what I'm talking about? I invited the people who had the respect of the community already to lunch. And we said, okay, here's the boundary. The boundary is we're going to have consistent assignments. Now, how do you want to organize yourselves into those consistent assignments? And I let those leaders amongst the staff, amongst the nurses and the CNAs, work that out amongst themselves. And then I said, okay, I'm telling you again, we're going to have consistent assignments, but you're going to go sell it to your coworkers. And so I went out and told everybody, we're going to have consistent assignments. I was a leader. And then behind the scenes, all through the day and all through the night and all through the shifts, those people that had been in that meeting that had agreed those would be the assignments that we were going to have were selling it because they got to know what's in it for them as well. So what happened with that was that as people were assigned to those neighborhoods, as they became not just their hallway but their neighborhood, they started taking ownership. And I had no idea that our housekeeper, who also our housekeepers were, were consistently staffed, could draw like this. And so each day I would come in and there would be a new drawing on the whiteboard in the neighborhood. And the families got to where they didn't even need to look at this whiteboard anymore to know who was working. Breakfast was a big one. It all starts there. Don't wake people up. Again, just talking about the values, the CNA started taking this on themselves. And we created work groups around things that we wanted to change. If we valued certain things, we created work groups around processes that we wanted to change. When you start getting some ownership, um, then there's a sense of pride. And um, when a family member comes in and says, why is my mom's room dirty? And you know you're going to see that same person every day, you dang well want to make sure that um, you clean it. Again, um, that was an area where we set the boundaries and then we let them work within those. So it didn't make sense for a housekeeper to come into a room where an elder didn't get up until 9.30 in the morning at 8 o'clock and try to clean it. So we had to work our cleaning schedules around them, not the other way around. And so it might not work for the housekeeper to be there, so it was the companion's responsibility to get that room clean because that was when it worked for that elder. Does that make sense? We had cats. I love cats. They're also the easiest thing, in my opinion, to take care of in a nursing home. We had children that came in, and it wasn't just that children came in and were there. We had story time, and that's one of our elders reading story time with the kids. So intergenerational stuff started happening. And i got to tell you about Big Daddy. Big Daddy's um, when he came to live with us, his daughter said, I cannot believe that you have cats in this building. That is just filthy. And besides the fact my dad has always hated cats, and he's never going to like this, but she left him there anyway. <laughs> Does Big Daddy look like he hates cats? <laughs> uh, no. Uh, there he is again. Again, dancing. This became a, a ritual on the second floor. Every afternoon, they, the CNAs would just spontaneously put different music on, and people would get up and dance and have a good time. Here we are again. Um, that's Oscar. And you've probably heard about this, but I'll tell you it's the truth. Our cats knew when people were passing. 
and um, they would park themselves there and not move. I cannot tell you how many family members told me how meaningful that was to them, that the cat was right there with their mom or their dad. I can also tell you that they always parked themselves there before the medical signs told us. And so we knew what was happening when they would park themselves on somebody's bed in somebody's room. This is Joyce, and a Muffin um, is there with Joyce. Joyce was brought to us um, by her daughter who said that um, she only had about two weeks left to live, and she just wanted her to be, live closer to her because she lived further away. And so she, when she came to us, she was on a pureed diet. And, but remember, we had consistently assigned staff, right? And so Christy came to us one day, and she said, you know, Joyce has got all of her teeth, and when I'm feeding her her pureed diet, she chews. And we were like, huh, let's check that out. Now, understand that this couldn't have happened if we were rotating the staff around because it would have been different people feeding her lunch every day. Christy fed her lunch five days a week and, so she, and breakfast, and so she figured out pretty quick she was chewing her food. So we, we figured it out, went through the whole thing, ordered her a regular diet. She lived for eight more months. There's that mortality rate that Rosemary was talking about. Not only did she live with us for eight more months, but all she would say when she got to us was yes and no. One day her daughter came in and she said, hey, Mom, how are you today? Just expecting a yes or no answer. Do you know what she heard? Well, she said, I've been thinking about getting a cat. My first day on the job, I walked up to the nurse's station to my charge nurse, and I said, tell me what's happening in the nursing home today. And she said, oh, well, we've got a man down the hall dying. And I said, oh, my gosh, we, we have somebody dying? Well, what are we doing about it? And she said, oh, well, we go check on him every 15 minutes. So as we started this process, I said to my team, this matters. This, this matters. I, I don't want anybody to die by themselves. What are we going to do? And they created this idea called, that they called the angel list. And they said, nobody's going to die alone in this nursing home anymore. And so we would talk with the families and interact with the families. And um, at some point in time, we would decide that it was time for the angel list to be enacted. And we would make it known throughout the entire community of staff that somebody was passing away in our building. And when the family couldn't be there, we made a commitment to be there. We would sit at their bedside with them so that nobody died alone. Um, today, that still goes on at the cottages at Brushy Creek, and we also don't take people out the back door. Um, actually, our staff, um, as a means of honoring people, stand at the front door, um, and we have elders that will stand there as well to say goodbyes. We closed Roger Huntington, and we built the cottages at Brushy Creek. It's 12 cottages. 12 elders live in each cottage. Two of the cottages we call guest cottages. So we have two cottages that are, that are short-term, Medicare Part A, if you will, rehab, that are guest cottages. The other 10 are what we call our vintage cottages. Our vintage cottages are like a fine wine. That's where people age and mature and grow, and we can enjoy them. And so again, that language is really important. This is as we were building it, and we were thinking, what the heck are we doing here? Now, let me just tell you that, again, one of the things you got to understand is that old sniff had to be as close to this as I could get it in operations before we moved there, okay? I couldn't just pick the staff up one day from one environment that looked like a hospital and operated like a hospital and move them into houses and expect that to operate. Does that make sense? Yeah, they had to already be operating that way before we got there. So this is a cottage fully built. Each cottage had a name. So it wasn't that you lived at 107 Brushy Creek Drive or whatever. You lived in Rose Cottage, 107 Brushy Creek Drive. This is our den and our fireplace. There's a sun porch at the back. This is what our furnace room looked like. But this is actually a publicity photo. So this isn't what they wound up looking like as people made them their own. We also let them choose their own room colors. Now I'll say that also had some boundaries because we couldn't just paint anything any color. We had several different colors that people could choose from, and as they were moving from Roger Huntington to cottages, we painted their room for them. In order for an elder to feel love and can thrive and grow, there are five things that they need to happen, and the first one is attachment. We also need to talk about and care plan how we're meeting these basic human needs. You think these two folks are attached? Yeah. And there's a bond there between those two people. They know that they belong together. 
And so they're meeting that human need of, of attachment and all that it is. Ours is a highly social species, and this is clearly shown in the form of specific bonds or attachment. Bonding is cross-culturally universal and instinct-like in nature. Attachment creates a safety net, and the loss of a primary attachment undermines one's sense of security. So this is about making people feel safe. And again, that same face day after day makes people feel safe. Inclusion is another basic human need that we all have. We all need to feel that we're included and belong to some place. Again, it's a social aspect that we each have um, related that we evolve from a species designed for life within face-to-face -face communication. Have you ever sent an email to somebody and they wrote you back and were like, well, you didn't have to be so snippy. <laughs> and you're thinking, uh, what in being snippy, you know? We need that face-to-face -face communication. Um, and so it's really, really important to include people and be face-to-face -face with them. If that's not met, people slump. If you think slumping is a part of aging, it's not. Slumping is a matter of self-protection. It's about, I can't deal with that world out there anymore. I can't deal as a person with the way I'm being treated. I can't deal with the fact that I'm not loved and my human needs are being met. And so I'm going to protect whatever little part of me I can until I just become like this and I slump over. But if you give people the opportunity to be loved and have their needs met and have an environment that supports them being who they are, they, they come back to you. So inclusion this inclusion to you? Occupation means to be occupied. We all need to be occupied. We all need to have an occupation. We all need to feel like we have meaning and self-worth. So our community decided that we wanted to have prayer boxes um, where people could drop their prayers. So we went to the um, work, wood, Woodman Workshop Guild, whatever it is, and we asked them, could you, um, could you create wood kits that then our seniors could put together. And so they were like, sure. They donated the wood, they donated the time, they made the kits, and our elders put them together. They were occupied. It had meaning to them when they saw those prayer boxes. Comfort, the word carries meanings of tenderness, closeness, the soothing of pain and sorrow, the calming of anxiety. Again, the feeling of security, which comes from being close to another. To comfort another person is to provide a kind of warmth and strength, which might enable them to remain in one piece when they are in danger of falling apart. Have you ever seen somebody start falling apart? It doesn't really matter whether you're talking about somebody with Alzheimer's or dementia, or it could be somebody else entirely. These same basic human needs still apply. This is my chaplain and one of our elders. Having a sense of identity, knowing who you are. You know, our identity is conferred by us. People treat us based on who, how they see us. So it's important for us, as we care for our elders, as we care for our seniors, to infer the proper identity on them of who they are as well because we help them continue being who they are as well. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, so again, um, this is a cottage who has an identity. This is a group of people that has an identity of attachment, of closeness, of inclusion. This is go, dog would go. We had competitions sometimes amongst the cottages, and, and these folks were, were rooting their cottage on. We called our CNAs companions. We didn't call them CNAs. We said that a companion has more, more meaning in some means than just being a CNA because you're permanently assigned. You've learned how to cook. You've learned how to clean. You've learned about activities. We taught them about the regulations. We had regulators come in to survey us, and my, my companions would say to the surveyor, I'm sorry, you can't walk in that kitchen. You haven't washed your hands or had a hairnet on yet. Hair, regulator, surveyor, put a hairnet on and wash your hands because it's more. They, there was a sense of pride, again, and ownership um, in their cottage. Now, this did not happen at Roger Huntington, I'm ashamed to tell you. This happened at the cottages, and it just happened as a part of the move. We moved in November, so Christmas was right after that. And so we said, you know, how does Christmas happen at home? Here's what happened. That's my chaplain, Ralph, dressed up as Santa Claus. And my three girls and my husband and my mom and my sister, every Christmas morning, and Ralph and his family, we got up. We opened our presents, and by 10 o'clock, we were at the cottages. And we handed out presents to every single cottage from under every tree to every single elder that lived there because that was Christmas morning. And, and the staff as well because it was Christmas morning, and that's what you do on Christmas morning. Values changes processes, changes environment. 
So this is the dining room. We started changing this in the old place in Roger Huntington. By the time we got here, people knew how to cook, and we short ordered breakfast every morning. You didn't start cooking somebody's egg until they got up and they told you how they wanted it. Just didn't happen. Talk about satisfaction surveys. Our satisfaction surveys went through the roof because the food wasn't coming down from a kitchen on a cart. Bump, 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 bump. <laughs> Waiting 30 minutes. Eggs are not good. Let me just tell you, eggs are not good after they've sat for 30 minutes. They're real good if they're cooked right from that stove and set on the table. This is a gentleman making cake for dinner that night. It was going to be the dessert. This is my daughter, Caitlin, delivering a Christmas present one morning. That's one of my favorite pictures, as you might imagine. Here's a senior, an elder in the kitchen, helping to cook, supervised. It was written in her care plan. My chef brought me this one, and I said, Morgan, what the heck is this? And he was like, look at this cool picture. And uh, I said, what, what, what is going on? And he said, she is refrigerator gawking. <laughs> Observe the hairnet on her head. We are in compliance with the regulations. Normal behavior. The cottages were extraordinary because we were so ordinary. Um, that was one of the things that we, that we told people. We had under-the-counter commercial dishwashers. The elders still helped. Here's another one. This lady was almost 100 years old, but she liked to help clean up after meals. Here's another lady helping prepare the meal ahead of time, helping pour the drinks. So how did we do all that? Here's another big tip for you, building community. You have to include and involve everybody. You have to seek meaning and contribution from the talents that people have. You have to share decision making, create opportunity for learning and growth. People constantly have to be learning and growing. Celebrate individual and team contributions. We did that every single month, all the time, through different methods, through the staff meetings, through the newsletters, through things that we did to praise people to success. So here we go again. Here's normal life. This lady uh, had late stages of Alzheimer's dementia. She couldn't feed herself when she came to us. By the time she passed away, she was feeding herself again. We also made a big push to get people out of wheelchairs. We had couches. Why were they in wheelchairs? This is her daughter laying on the couch with her. When she came to see her mom, she said, I haven't seen my mom out of a wheelchair in five years. They curled up on the couch together. That's normal mom-daughter. Yeah, if it was my mom, I'd be curled up like that with her. <laughs> Hattie is the uh, CNA that you, that you can't see kind of there to the side. Hattie figured out that her cottage, Dogwood Cottage, had less anxiety and less sundowning if they sat outside and ate breakfast each morning. So they started as a ritual of a cottage um, when it was a warm summer day, getting up and eating breakfast outside. I didn't dictate that. Again, that was them owning their elders. Again, snow. It doesn't snow that often in Greenville, but when it does... We get out there um, and we celebrate it as a normal part of life. Birthdays, this also happened naturally. Again, it wasn't something that we dictated. We said, oh my gosh, when we, when we got to the cottages, we were like, this birthday thing is ridiculous. One of the elders said, well, I want macaroni and cheese and fried chicken and green beans and blah, blah, blah for my birthday. Can you do that? And the staff were like, yep, we can do that. So somebody else whose birthday was a couple of days later said, well, how come I don't get to pick what I want for my birthday? All right, you can pick what you want for your birthday. And so it spread and it became a tradition. Everybody picks their meal for their birthday and their own cake. This is just normal life, guys. Does this look like a nursing home to you? Here's Lucy. Lucy was contracted when she came to us at Roger Huntington. She had deep wounds in her legs. Um, she didn't ever come out of her room. But as the excitement built of moving to the cottages, she started coming out of her shell. One of my nurse managers was telling me that she walked into the cottage one day and she saw this lady without her top on digging in the drawer and the thing. And she was like, oh, my, this is not good. Let me go in there and shut the door and, you know, preserve her dignity and figure out what's going on. You know what was happening? Lucy was getting dressed for bed. This is the lady that was laying in bed contracting and not speaking a couple of months ago, folks. You cannot do any of this if you are not providing exceptional care already to some extent. You have to already have your table stakes. You have to have your baseline really, really good, okay? So yeah, there were things at Roger Huntington medically that needed improving, but we already had pretty good processes in place. You, you get me? We were taking good medical care of people. We didn't have a lot of people with pressure sores and all those kinds of things, okay? We were taking good medical care of people. So we healed Lucy's wounds, but we, could, we had trouble healing her soul. 
one of the last things I want to tell you about the cottages is that we started uh, as a community, we decided that we wanted to have an opportunity for all the cottages to come together at least once a month. And so once a month we came together and had a, a non-denominational worship service and afterwards we kind of had like a dinner on the ground, like an old um, southern Sunday afternoon. And so everybody ate down there. I mean, each cottage um, made something and um, brought it down to the community center. But we realized pretty quickly that if we we're going to have a worship service, we needed a choir. And so staff, elders, family members participated in the choir. But, you know, if you're going to have a choir, you have to have choir uniforms, right? Um, now, again, that was not my decision. That was the elders' decisions who told me we had to have choir outfits. And so they made those little red and pink things that you see hanging around their neck. Those are their choir robes. We were invited to perform for 600 people at a conference, and so we loaded up our entire choir, and that's my choir from the cottages at Brushy Creek singing a song called Go Light Your World. And it was an amazing, amazing experience for, for all of them. And if anybody thinks that those elders that are on that stage are any different than yours, <laughs> you are wrong. They are just like your elders that you take care of every single day. And so that's the cottages at Brushy Creek. <laughs> This is where I am now. I moved to the Cascades Verde, uh, which is a large CCRC. And yes, it is really nice. So I've had to get used to people who are used to having money making demands on me. This has been a learning experience this past six months, let me tell you. <laughs> and so people that live in those brick buildings up front, they are, live independently. It's set up a lot like the cottages in that there's a kitchen and there's a den and there's rooms around that. And so it's this theme of community and home and resources. Now let me tell you something really cool about this. Did you know that there are bathing suits for people that are incontinent? I didn't know that. I found that out. There are. So even people with dementia can get in the pool with our staff. Talk about creating a bond. Talk about trust. Talk about creating, knowing each person to get in the pool with somebody, to exercise with somebody, to just move around. Talk about decreasing sundowning, hello, it's working, it's amazing. It, it, it truly is phenomenal um, and it doesn't matter what it looks like. That's what I want you to hear. Forget how pretty it looks, okay? That's not the point. The point is the people and the processes and what's happening within how pretty it looks. Sometimes you don't even know what's going to spark something. I visit over 30 nursing homes a month with my church and this is the best of the best, I guarantee you. I just wanted to make a comment. I actually had the opportunity to go and visit a culture change um, facility in North Carolina. I went there really skeptical and I left um, really embarrassed and we are a good facility and we are deficiency free um, in nursing since I've been there. And when I left, I just felt like we are really treating our residents wrong after seeing how this um, operated and functioned and how they actually have their life back and everything is so institutionalized and routine at our facility. So um, it, it is a, there is a difference and it is very doable. Thank you, You're thank welcome. you. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. How much ownership did the residents have in the process? They had a lot. <laughs> we were constantly having meetings with them just like we were having with the staff, just like we were having with families. Um, again, and they, it was amazing too when we moved how quickly they took ownership and started telling us what to do instead of the other way around. <laughs> but truly, a huge change happened when we, um, when we made that move. I mean, it was already happening before, but it was dramatically different when we moved. How do you uh, broach the subject uh, with uh, nursing home administrators? We're talking about processing going from a traditional um, institutional model to a culture change model. Uh -huh, right. How do you broach that subject then to start that transition into the rest of the There's several things that you can do. You can take them to a place like the cottages and let them see it for themselves. You can take pictures of people and say, if you think people aren't lonely and helpless and bored in this community, look at that. And so if you can get people to understand that it's about them, then they can then translate that to other people. Does that make sense? They, they have to sit in, that sh in those shoes. Thank you. I've enjoyed it. Thank you very much.